Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program. Uh, we have Dr. James Gibb with us, and he's going to be presenting the program Caf Crafting Shell Buttons on the Delmarva Peninsula. So Jim is the owner of Jim Archaeological what's the name, Consulting in Annapolis, and Jim volunteers for the Smithsonian Laboratory, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Edgewood, Maryland, and he is joining us to share his expertise with us again this evening, and I'd like to welcome him, and with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, it, Jim is fine with you keeping your video on. Uh, go ahead and mute yourselves so that we don't get background noise as he's speaking, and feel free as, as he's going ahead and you don't mind if they ask questions as you're talking, do you, Jim? Not at all. Okay, so people can, if you feel free to just jump in there and ask a question, that's fine. Or if you wanna ask a question in the chat box, that's fine as well. And at the end, we'll go ahead and answer all the questions. So with that, I'd like to welcome Jim. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm not so much sharing my expertise, but sharing the expertise of uh, our citizen science crew. So, but uh, let me see if I can get this thing up here. Yeah, it worked before, right? Yes. <laughs> let me see if I can find it here. There we go. Ah. I see much. it now. So you're doing. You can see it. I can't <laughs> see. I can't see. It's hiding behind all this stuff. There we go. Let me just. Okay. And hmm. there we go. Okay. Uh, can you see that then? Yes. All right. Good. All right. Well, I'm glad you could all join us this evening. Um, if, uh, before I get too far into this, I want to talk a little bit about our citizen science program since this, like all of our projects uh, at CERC, uh, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, uh, are really the products of citizen science research. And citizen science is when folks who aren't necessarily trained in science uh, help develop and implement scientific research projects. And so we've been at it, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center for, it'll be nine years this summer. Let me just get the acronyms down for you. If you see at the bottom of the slide, Smithsonian Environmental Research Center is CERC, and the Smithsonian Environmental Archaeology Laboratory is SEAL. So we're part of the SEAL team. Um, and the work uh, I'm talking about this evening is really based on the list of individuals you see there, uh, at least a couple of whom are on this call. Uh, Jim Breedlove, Leo Plourd, uh, I didn't notice anybody else. I like holding up Benjamin Franklin as sort of our patron saint because he was in effect a citizen scientist. Uh, you may recall from your history, he trained as a printer and that's how he made his living as a printer. He was not trained in science. In fact, hardly anybody was trained in science in the 18th century. Uh, it was really uh, the work of folks who are just avocational, who taught themselves. And so the folks who are part of this pro research project uh, follow in his footsteps. So let's get going with this. We start off with a question. Why make shell buttons in Delmarva? And you might also ask, who cares? Well, hopefully I will cover these things this evening. But a few facts I wanted to point out. Uh, shell button making been going on in the US you know, since we were founded as a nation, uh, pretty much along the eastern, eastern coast of the United States. But really kind of mass production of shell buttons began in the upper Midwest, uh, pretty much in the Mississippi Valley area. And it started pretty much in the 1890s. That was a hot spot because yellow sand shell mussels, and you'll see some pictures of these uh, in a few moments, uh, were quite prolific uh, in, in the drainage uh, and they were well suited for making shell buttons. The last fact I want to point out is that the Chesapeake and Delaware Bays have very few species, really hardly one, 
uh, whelks that are appropriate for making buttons, shell buttons. So if we don't have the shells necessary for making them, why are we making them here? And so that's what I'm going to, the question I'm going to address this evening. Uh, I'll, I'll let the cat out of the bag. I don't know what the answer is. So. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about how buttons are fashioned from shell. And then I want to talk about my favorite topic in archaeology, which is variability. And that is, how are things different? How do people doing the same sort of thing do it differently? And what are the implications of those differences? So we're going to look at variability in shop size, the, the plant, the, the uh, factory, if you will, variability in raw materials, and variability in the products that they produced in those shops from those raw materials. Some other issues we're going to hit on, which are really important, uh, rural electrification. A uh, little history reminder here, the Real Rural Electrification Act, uh, Congress passed that in 1936. It was part of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. And that provided federal funds, loans, for developing electric grids to serve rural areas. So they started pretty much in small towns and rural areas and then spread out from those rural towns. But electrification was really important because it freed people from water power. With electricity, you could set up a shop anywhere as long as you had electricity running to it. I'll talk a little bit about race and gender in the industry uh, with some fairly new data we've developed. Uh, how do these communities adapt to resource depletion? You know, what happens when you run out of shells? And then how does, uh, how does it, this is something that really interests me, how does a community uh, develop an important part of its economy using a natural resource over which it has absolutely no control. Because as you'll see during the course of this talk, virtually all of the shell used to make shell buttons on the Delmarva Peninsula was imported. So let's talk a little bit first about where the raw material comes from. These are the kinds of shellfish we have most commonly in the Chesapeake and Delaware Bays. You got your classic quahog or clam, uh, mussels, oysters, and uh, whelks. Quahogs, uh, you all may recall, the Indians used to make wampum out of that. They, using you know, little stone tip drills, they'd make beads out of the clam shells. The, the, the material is really good for making something like beads or buttons. The problem is the clams tend to be fairly small and they're kind of dome shaped so the it's difficult to use these in mass production. When you want to be banging out lots of buttons per minute, these shells are not ideal for that. Mussels are, are quite prolific in both bays. The problem is they, they have a nice shiny uh, knacker that enter uh, reflective surface, but they're very thin and brittle. So they're totally unsuited. Oyster shells have a laminar structure. Uh, they're absolutely worthless for making buttons. And whelks uh, have the right material like the clams, but their geometry is such that it's very difficult to make a lot of buttons very quickly using whelks. You see somebody's ringing the doorbell here. Uh, these are the most common shells that uh, our, our group has found in, in, in the industry. Uh, principal among them, albeit upside down, is a yellow sand shell. Uh, these are freshwater mussels that thrive in the Mississippi Basin and the Missouri and you know, most of the rivers of central United States. Uh, they don't occur in this region that I'm aware of. I think they used to occur up in New York State but are considered uh, extirpated. They don't exist there anymore. Pearl oysters, which the, the picture doesn't do justice. Pearl oysters could be huge. I mean, they're the size of my foot and I wear a size 14 triple E, so they can get pretty big and heavy and thick. They are ideal for making shell buttons on an industrial scale. The conus uh, shells, both the conus top and tooth top conus, um, they think the material is good, but as you can see from the geometry, and as you see in a few moments, I'll show you how these things are made. They're not ideal for getting a lot of shell button blanks out in a, in a short period of time. And then finally, we have the black abalone, which you'll see along the coast of California. 
I think these things are becoming are coming back, but uh, were they were heavily overfished, uh, certainly in the 20th century. I remember as a kid, you know, you, people often use them for ashtrays. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're sort of like an overgrown limpet or, or uh, yeah, limpet, I guess, would be the closest thing. So these are the basic types that are used and none of them occur around here. Pearl oysters come from the South Pacific, the yellow sand shell from the Midwest, conus, the uh, uh, conical shells there, they come from the Indian Ocean and other parts around the world, but not around here. And the abalone comes from the West Coast. Uh, I don't know how, uh, I don't think we uh, figured out how pearl oysters were harvested in the South Pacific. I think our suspicion was people used to simply dive for them uh, because they're, they're collecting these things, they're looking for pearls, and they're also shipping out the shells. And you'll notice, let me see if I get my pointer up here. There we go. So this box that they're stacking these shells in, uh, that's some pretty expensive hardwood they're using there. And this is what they're shipping the shells back to the United States and you'll see an image of this in a moment. In the upper Mississippi Valley, they're using these uh, barges with a dredge to just dredge up the bottom of uh, uh, the streams to collect the uh, mussels. Uh, this dredging, of course, is, is never a good thing eco ecolog ecologically, uh, but uh, because of the damage it does to the waterway, but it also over-harvested uh, the yellow sand shell. Let's see. Uh, we took these pictures in the uh, basement of one of the shell cutting shops I'll show you in a moment. So this is one of those crates you just saw in that historic photo. And it says on it, produce of Australia. And on this one here, on this end, it says AMP New York. Well, that's part of the story in, in um, how this stuff gets here. It's coming from the South Pacific gets shipped into New York City, and from New York, it gets shipped out to the various factories. And this is occurring beginning in the 1920s and big time in the 1930s and later. So it's, it's moving, it's, it's, it's being trucked. You just load up on trucks and send it to where it needs to be. So here's a look at some of the shops. Um, for those of you guys who are on this call who've uh, worked on this project, You'll notice that this one in the upper left hand is a new one. Uh, my doing some commercial archaeology last spring, we found this uh, shop right up alongside the road. And we dug a couple of holes right in front of it and came up with waste from shell button making. So we know it, this was a button shop. This one here is um, Ellicott, uh, Elliott Island, which is about 20 minutes west of Vienna, Maryland out in some marsh area. It's no longer a shop. It's been uh, adaptively reused as a hunting lodge. In fact, the one here in Milton was, well, it hasn't been adapted for anything. It's just been, they removed all the machinery. It's now basically just a storehouse. Uh, this one in the lower right-hand corner, Milford, Delaware, is the shop that started all this work to begin with. Uh, a friend of mine told me about it years ago and he brought me to it. We went inside with the owner's permission. And I thought, what a great research project. But I was always too busy. I just couldn't do it by myself. And it was when we started the program at Smithsonian, the citizen science program, that all of a sudden we had folks who would be interested in pursuing this. And so this project uh, laid on the back burner for 11 years before we finally got around to doing it. And um, You'll see some of the documentation of that shop in a moment. And the lower right-hand corner is the um, uh, Schwanda shop in Denton, Maryland. And you'll see another interesting photograph of this in a moment. This was built in the late 1930s. Uh, these uh, people of Denton, Maryland actually courted uh, a shell button maker up in New York to come down and set up a shop in Denton. Um, they, they provided some free land and built some roads. And uh, the folks of Denton wanted this because they're in the middle of the Great Depression. And this was considered a, a good source of wage employment. And it was. Uh, 
this is the shop in, in Milton that we just found this past spring. And I uh, to show you this drawing because you could see those windows. That's one of the defining traits of these shops. They have a nice bank of windows on each side because natural light was very important for doing the work. It's kind of close to work. Uh, so natural light and electrical light really uh, made these shops feasible. They're bare bones. This one was just concrete block, uh, but it did have, it has a chimney uh, for a stove. So clearly it was intended to use, be used in cold weather, uh, which is important to know because these shops weren't just seasonal, they were used the year round. This is the interior of the shop in uh, Milford. And the family that owns it has been storing stuff in there for a lot of years. But you could still see uh, the bank of machines along this wall. And there's another bunch along this wall here. So there are 14 machines set up for cutting shell button blanks. And when we walked in there, it was remarkable because you know, aside from the boxes of old National Geographics and all that, you could go to each machine and it looked like the people working there just stepped out for lunch one day and didn't come back. Everything was there. You could see the, the, the shell button blanks that they had cut, just cut and laying in these pans and never even boxed up uh, for sale. So it's, it's just a wonderful uh, find archaeologically because we could really get a sense of how these places were set up and how they operated. This is one of those shell uh, button cutting machines. Basically, it's a lathe. And what you do uh, on the left hand side, this is where you would hold a shell. And a lot of these guys used to just hold it in their, in their hand. And then on uh, barely see it here, but there'd be a circular bit. I have a photograph of this so I could show you in a moment. It's a, a tubular saw. And with the lathe handle, you simply advance that saw to the shell that you're holding in your hand. And it just cuts a, a, a cylindrical plug out of the shell, ejects it, and then you go and cut another one. Uh, I would have thought these things would be a bit dangerous. And maybe they were. One of the dangers, of course, is you're cutting through shell and there'd be a lot of dust, a lot of lime dust, calcium from that, uh, which wouldn't take long to badly injure your eyes and your lungs. Each of these stations had a little vacuum system set up to suck that dust away. And I'll show you something about that in a moment too. So here's a, uh, our architectural rendering of the floor plan of the shop. Each of these numbers represents a station where one of these machines was located. What it doesn't show you is overhead, there was a, uh, a belt system. So there was one electric motor that uh, rotated a, a steel shaft around which were pulleys. And from those pulleys, leather belts that went down to each of the machines. So all that machinery was operating overhead uh, to make each of the lathes work. What you do see along here in blue, that's a duct system, uh, the vacuum system that took the dust away from each of these stations and out to a, uh, a trap outside the building. That dust could be used for a lot of things. It could be used uh, as a fertilizer because it's rich in calcium. And that and the little chunks of shell could be uh, mixed in with poultry feed. Poultry need that grit, grit to help digest their food and a, the hens need the calcium for eggshells. So none of this probably was wasted. Also in the far right-hand side, or exterior to the building, you can see something, the electrical service. This is not, this, this is operated by electricity. Uh, the Parachek brothers who built this around 1940 uh, had a place up in uh, Connecticut that I'll show you in a moment that was not electrical. But here you could see, uh, this is part of the vacuum system in the basement, but here in the lower right-hand corner, you could see is sort of like a hose or tube. That's part of that vacuum system. And this pipe out here is the trap for that material. Presumably there was, it was open and there'd be a, some sort of bag uh, clamped over it to catch the dust. 
for use elsewhere. Uh, this is William Paracek. It's interesting, a lot of the folks who established these shops in the United States in the uh, first, second quarter of the 20th century were from Eastern Europe. Uh, I don't know what the connection is. I mean, some from one of the German states or what is now what became Czechoslovakia now is Czech and uh, Bohemia and these, these other, uh, the map keeps changing, but they are from that part of the world. So this is their newly opened shop in 1926. And this is a more recent photograph of that shop. And you notice this earthenwork here to the left of the building, that's a mill dam. This thing operated on water power in 1926. By the time these guys set up the shop uh, in the late 30s, early 40s in Delaware, it was all electrical. And again, that meant that they weren't, they didn't need to camp out next to a stream. They didn't need water power. They could set it up wherever was convenient for them. This is, there is a couple of large uh, shell uh, button factories uh, on Delmarva. Uh, one of them was the Excelsior in Federalsburg, Maryland. Uh, but another one was in Milton, Delaware, the Lippincott factory. And uh, you could see from this photograph it's a pretty big place, bigger than what I've been showing you. And, you know, I, I don't know how many people are working in there. And this is just a cutting room. At this factory, I think they also did some other, you know, they did more than just cut shell blanks. Those small shops, by and large, just cut the blanks and shipped them up to New York where they'd be finished into buttons. Uh, Lip and Cotton, some of the other larger factories, they did the entire uh, acid etching and and uh, dyeing buttons and drilling them and creating that little circular depression in the middle of the button, referred to as knurling. Uh, so this, this uh, was a pretty big place. And as I recall, it had a staff of something over 100 people. So big. So here's, a, here's, here's how it happens. Again, you've got this machine with a tubular saw on it. You hold the shell in your left hand, you advance that uh, saw into the shell. And once it cuts all the way through, you retract it and that plug drops out into a pan and then you go and cut the next. And then you've got this vacuum system that's sucking away the dust. This, by the way, is a photograph, I think Jim Breedlove might've taken this one uh, at the Vienna Historical Society in Maryland, where the entire contents of one of the last shop in the area out at El Elliott Island was donated. And so all that equipment is now set up in the historical society. So you can actually see it. Pretty marvelous. It's a picture of two of those saws. Um, I don't know, they're roughly three eighths to a half an inch in diameter. Buttons are measured in terms of lines, L-I-N-E-S. Uh, and there are 40 lines to an inch. So the larger of the two on top is 21 lines, which means it's a little more than half an inch. And the one below it is 18 lines. So that's how, measure, that's how buttons were measured and perhaps still are, I don't know. Uh, I don't work with buttons. And you can see what those circular saws do to a shell. These are, were actually donated to us by uh, uh, Barbara Israel uh, from a site in Muscatine, Iowa, which is really where this industrial scale button shell button making started uh, in the 1890s. And I don't, I, don't, I don't even know what species these are. They're not the yellow sand shell, but you could see they, you know, the nice hole they drill through. These are actually two different sizes. And this one wasn't even completed. It's only partially cut through. These are some of the shells we've recovered uh, they seem to, hmm, we're losing some of the image here, at least on my screen. Um, but this is yellow sand shell here. You could see they try to get as many blanks as possible out of each shell. Um, this is the one of the cone top shells. And these over here on the right are um, uh, pearl oysters in the South Pacific. And the object is to get as many uh, plugs 
out of each cell as you can, as quickly as you can, because this is mass production and people are paid piecework, either by the number of button blanks they produce or by the weight of the button blanks they produce for a given size. So these guys really got to uh, move quickly. So on the left, you see an example of what these plugs look like. They're just, you know, thick, you know, cylindrical pieces of shell, which are then split on this splitting machine to become over here on the right, the blanks. And those blanks for these smaller shops typically were shipped up to New York, Connecticut, um, where they would be finished. And I think part of the reason for that is that uh, buttons changed with fashions. And New York was the heart of the garment industry in this country. And so by finishing the buttons up there, uh, they could produce buttons that were what clothing designers were calling for in any particular season. So I think that, you know, it was just, we need the blanks, we can quickly turn them into what we need and we'll decide at the time what we, what we need. So a lot of these guys just producing blanks. This is a topographic map we created of the, um, uh, the, the uh, Paracheck shop up in Milford. So this is the footprint of the shop. And over here, actually hiding under uh, my window here, you could see there are two shell uh, piles, numbers one and two. Uh, number one consisted mostly of waste from yellow sand shell. Number two consisted mostly of waste from the pearl oyster. You know, why they were separating this stuff, I don't know. Uh, but when we went out there and did our initial work, we sampled shell from each pile so we get some sense of, you know, what, what they were doing, you know, what, what, what species were they using, how intensively were they using them. <laughs> Uh, this, uh, oh, I'm afraid I don't remember his name. Uh, this is, he, he died some years ago, but he was the owner at the time when it first went out there, oh, probably 15 years or more ago now. And we we're doing a uh, mapping the site. So he's holding a, a ranging pole here. Uh, but this is one of those shell heaps, uh, waste from the shell button making process. Mm -hmm. And this is a close-up photograph it took you know, a year, about a year ago, <laughs> after we were coming back from Delaware, where we found that uh, that shop in Milton. We stopped off at the site and took some pictures, all covered with leaves at this point. But you could get a sense of what these piles are like. And these are all pearl oysters in the South Pacific. So the products. Uh, well, what do you expect? We, you know. They make buttons, they're button shops. It's not like they diversified, made a lot of different things. They made one thing, and the, really the question is, did they make the complete button on site or did they just make the blanks? The shop out at Elliott Island, you know, out west of Vienna uh, on the Eastern shore, they were around till I think 1995. And they were really the last shop around and they got to the point where they were producing for a specialty market. Uh, and so they were making very small buttons and they were doing the whole process. They were you know, polishing uh, the blanks, knurling them, drilling them, uh, dyeing them, as you can see in the right-hand group. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're producing a finished product, but most of the shops didn't do that. Most of them were just making blanks. Uh, of course, they also, uh, you know, when these things are finally made, uh, they were sold uh, either in bulk, uh, mostly to the garment industry, but also sewed onto cards like these uh, for sale. And maybe we still sell buttons that way. I don't know. Um, I, I haven't looked. I don't. I usually find my buttons when I when they come off and sew them on. I don't go out and buy them. But uh, I remember in five and dime stores, this is the way you found buttons sewn onto mm -hmm. these cards. But these are all made from sure, uh, shell. And you can see this one's called Ocean Pearl. And this one over here, Genuine Pearl. Um, the idea of these shell buttons is that they, um, they had that lustrous, lustrous finish to them that glass buttons or 
and um, fabric buttons, of course, just didn't have. Uh, and aside from buttons, of course, the, uh, there was a byproduct I mentioned earlier, and that is the dust and chips of shell, which could be used for fertilizer and poultry feed. Yeah. One thing most of them did not make are <laughs> plastic buttons, which really started coming out after World War II. World War II was a, a, a landmark event in many ways, not least of which was in the growing, rapidly growing use of plastic. Mm. Uh, plastics were really developed during the war to uh, take the place of glass. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Hollywood movie uh, from 1949, I think, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed and Lionel Barrymore and all those other folks. Well, there's a scene in there where Jimmy Stewart's childhood friend is now running his father's company and he says, here's my word of advice to you, invest in plastics. And there's even a clip showing him in a wartime factory uh, where they're making the, the cowlings, the covers of aircraft, you know, for, for the pilots and gunners would sit. Plastic. Once the war was over, we had, had all this capacity for producing all sorts of things, not least of which was plastic. And so it found a ready market making all sorts of consumer goods, including buttons. So plastic buttons pretty quickly because they were so inexpensive and you could mold them into any shape you wanted. They didn't require any real skill uh, to, to ma make them. So they came in and that's what we have today. I think the, the Excelsior factory in Federalsburg did make the switch to plastics. Oh. Missing part of the image here. Don't know why. Oh, there she is. So, you know, by the time we get into the late 20th century, there are very few of these people doing this anymore. They're doing a specialty, a niche market. And so they're making really small, delicate buttons for things like Barbie dolls and, and, and the king's uh, sequined uh, performance costumes. Uh, that's, that's, that's where we got to. From an industry that provided, I don't know what percentage of the buttons nationwide, probably 50% or better, uh, was reduced to a few shops producing uh, uh, for a niche market. Uh, some interesting things from anthropologically and historically we could look at in any kind of industry is how is labor organized? You know, does race play a, a part in it? Does gender and age? Uh, and one of the questions we had about you know, the major question is why Delaware? Why move this industry to Delaware? Or why, why expand it into Delaware where the natural resource doesn't occur? And one of the things we've discovered in our research is that in the second and third decades of the 20th century, in places like Muscatine, Iowa, where the industry focused, there were a lot of labor problems. Union, a union had formed, there were strikes, and it may be one of the reasons they decided to try uh, button making on in Delmarva is it was a way of getting around the unions, moving operations into a non-union area. We have some data that um, one of our very short-term citizen scientists collected from uh, the US uh, population schedules of the census. We checked the censuses for 1930 for Delaware. And really we weren't finding anybody who was listed in an occupation uh, or employment in a button factory. And that's because the industry was probably just on eve of taking off. But 1940 for Denton and Federalsburg, we have um, people who show up in the censuses. We had 161 people who the census marshals identified as working in the button industry. And you could see uh, the occupations here. We, we don't know what this means. You know, census marshals made a lot of mistakes, so it, we're not sure what, what, what's happening here. But we recognize most of these occupations here. Uh, this is the popular same census that we fill out today as part of the, you know, uh, congressional representation, all that as required by the constitution. Uh, 
So there's all kinds of sociological information available. We have the names of each of these people. I'm not showing them, but there we have them. So we have out of 161 people in these uh, two places, only two of them are African-American and both are male. And they're just down as factories, so they could be doing just about anything. A lot of folks went down as just factory. So we don't know if they were cutters or polishers or anything else. My guess is knowing what we know about how things worked around here, these folks were probably working janitorial. Um, but you look at this. I mean, we see you know 75 white females, 84 white males, almost even. And when you figure that most of these folks worked at Excelsior in Federalsburg, I think 15 worked in Denton. So one white female and 14 white males worked in Denton. If you do the arithmetic, that means that there were uh, what 70 at, at just at uh, at Excelsior. There were 70 white men working, and 74 white women. So there are actually more women than men. The women, however, are almost uh, by and large. We have two that were listed as button cutters, and again, we don't know what factory means. Uh, whereas 22 um, men were known as cutters. Cutting, cutting the blanks was typically a male uh, occupation. The women were often involved in dyeing and sorting the, uh, the buttons, uh, going through and make, pulling out imperfections and stuff like that. So we got some little bit of basic data here. Clearly it's an industry largely of white people uh, with in, at least in the bigger shops, uh, more or less parity between men and women, probably not in pay, but just in terms of numbers. Uh, in the smaller shops, uh, women would have been pretty rare, I think. They'd be mostly men. And one other chart we have is in terms of age. Uh, if we look at those same numbers and look at them in terms of, because we, we know how old each of these individuals were in 1940, uh, you could see men and women, the uh, men are uh, in blue, the uh, women are in red. And you could see most of them were roughly between 20 years old and 30 years old. And after 30, their numbers decline pretty precipitously. So, um, and, and I bet the older folks here are probably those who were in supervisory position, both uh, foremen and four ladies as they were referred to, um, or they were clerical. But the actual operations folks, according to this one census for those two places, they were largely uh, men and women in their 20s. And yet, uh, I showed you this a little earlier, this photograph of the interior of the Lippincott factory. You look at this and you go, okay, well, those are probably, you can't really tell for certain, but these are probably all white men. But uh, <laughs> they don't look that young to me. <laughs> maybe, maybe people just look older there or they're just uh, a little worse for the wear, but uh, this looks like a somewhat older crowd. And again, this is just the cutting room. And with, you know, the distance back here, we can't really see, make out people very clearly. Um, this isn't the entire operation. We don't have a photograph of the interiors of the other rooms. But it does tend to bear out that they're mostly white men. And these are not the ones who were included in the census. Uh, uh, this photograph, I think, is a little later than that census is. So I mentioned declining resources, you know, you know, they need shell. Without shell, you don't have shell buttons. Uh, again, these, these are the common types that were used, but with the smaller shops and those that date to the 1930s to maybe 1950s, typically what we're finding are the first two, the yellow sand shell and the pearl oyster. We're not, we're not finding these other types of shell. I think we find them on the later sites and the bigger shops. And again, let's see if we have pictures of what these, here's, here, here's that shop in Denton. I showed you an image of it before, but you see the sawtooth roof. It was pretty advanced architecture for uh, the late 1930s, but all that glass was really important because it admitted light and provide a lot of natural light. So, yeah, around that building, and you can't see it because it's to the left outside the image here, but there's a wall that goes around the yard 
on the other side of this building. And the top of that concrete block wall are a bunch of whelk shells that are cemented in to the top of the wall. Uh, almost the way some people will put broken glass and other things, sharp items to the top of a wall to keep people from vaulting over them or sitting on top of them. And this is what they all look like. They've all been drilled. So these are almost certainly local whelks uh, that have been harvested for making buttons. Here's a map, a topographic map we made of the shop. So this is the building right here. The heavy stippled areas are concrete walkways. This is a large machine, large vacuum machine that took all the dust out of the shop. But around this courtyard is a wall and on that wall are all these shells. And also at the base of this wall over here is this, what well, for lack of a better word, is a shell midden. It's a whole bunch of mostly yellow sand shell, uh, but also these are conical types. And uh, I think we had some abalone in there too. A real mixture of stuff. And here's, here's a few pictures of what we've got. So you can see, this is one of those, those, those cone top shells. You don't get many blanks out of these and they're probably kind of hard to handle. So these are not ideal material. And these shells, which actually we thought were uh, pearl oyster, but they're in fact another species, I don't remember the name of it offhand. But those and some of these yellow sand shells were very small shells. So we think they were simply, tossed out because the cutters you know found them unsuitable for making buttons and this i think is this is black abalone it's been pretty well drilled up so, so looking at this thing the hypothesis is that the um, high quality shells were simply not uh were becoming less available perhaps more expensive and so these folks had to opt for less and less suitable shell. So finding stuff like this is probably a pretty good indication that there are serious supply problems. And these are almost certainly deposited after World War II as well. And they're from all around the world. So this isn't a World War II shortage, which all these factories would have suffered and probably a lot of them shut down uh, for lack of material. Even material from the Midwest, you know, in the middle of the war, we're not wasting gasoline and, and people power uh, moving shells across the country so we can make buttons, at least not shipping them all the way to Delaware. So one of the hypotheses is that the we were depleting the stocks of suitable shell and opting for less and less suitable material until basically it just gave up and went to plastics. So, Let's sort of wrap this up. What have we learned from all this? Well, we have some idea of the whole process of making shell buttons, the crafting. Uh, the data we've collected pretty well suggests that the heyday for this industry in Delmarva, and I'm not talking about the Midwest or anywhere else. You know, we haven't looked at that. But the heyday around here seems to have been the 1930s uh, through 1950s. Uh, after that, we get uh, more, some of these places are closing down. And we know of at least one instance in uh, Milton where a factory shut down. We get this from, through oral testimony. Um, and they sold their machines to whatever workers, who, whoever wanted to buy them. And so some of the folks who used to work in these uh, larger factories bought these machines, took them home, set them up in a shed or in their barn, and did it in their spare time. And I actually met the guy who used to do this, a, a fellow who was at the time younger than I, was a distributor and he would bring them shells on I think a monthly basis and collect the blanks and bring them and ship them up north where they'd be finished into buttons. Uh, that pretty much ended by around 1990, if not a little earlier. Uh, we see some variability among these button cutting shops. I think uh, the more of these we find, uh, the clearer the typology will become. We will see these typical small ones like Milford, Milton, and Elliott uh, Island. And then there are some of these big factories, probably none of, well, the one in Federalsburg, Excelsior survives, but it's been heavily uh, uh, modified, uh, I think by the city of Federalsburg for trucks and whatnot. 
Uh, but I think we'll probably see large factories and a lot of these little shops and maybe occasionally something in between. And the size and complexity of the buildings say something about the size and complexity of the workforce. Uh, the bigger places are going to have a lot more people. They're probably going to have a lot more women. And they're going to have a more division of labor. You know, they're probably producing finished buttons. Whereas the small shops, uh, almost all white, probably all men. And they're probably just cutting blanks. And so when the industry starts declining, what kind of shop you worked in probably had something to do with what your employment prospects were. I think a lot of the small shops went under pretty quickly with a few exceptions. Uh, we learned that there doesn't seem to be any children working in these places. They're all adults and mostly aged uh, 20s and early 30s uh, with a few older folks who very likely were uh, more managerial and uh, clerical positions. And women in the bigger factories, uh, in terms of numbers, had pretty close to parity with the men. Uh, you can bet dollars to donuts they weren't being paid anywhere near what the men were getting. And hopefully we'll be able to get those numbers at some point. Uh, and pearl and yellow show, sand shell were the preferred species. Uh, but it looks like, you know, probably sometime in the 1950s or later, that at least the bigger companies uh, to survive are getting less and less suitable shells. And so they become less and less competitive. So uh, sort of finish it all off, you know, one of the things we're looking at here is community and industry resilience. How do these operations survive when they do not control the critical raw material? In fact, really the only raw material you really need for this process are those shells and uh, they're not available locally. They have to be shipped in. And that puts the industry and the communities that depend on those, that industry at quite a disadvantage. If those shells stop coming as they did during World War II, that's probably when the Paracheck factory in uh, Milford closed down. They opened around 1940, it may well have closed not too long afterwards you know, after just a, uh, maybe two years of operation, simply because we weren't shipping shells out of the South Pacific anymore. Not those kinds of shells anyway. Um, and in, with wartime restrictions, we weren't shipping shells out of the Midwest to the East Coast to make buttons. So anyway, I think that's about all I had for this evening. This is an ongoing project. Um, so um, all I can say is stay tuned. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Sorry, I was muted there for a second. I can read off the few that were uh, typed into the chat section um, and then we can just open it up to whoever would like to ask a question. Uh, Cindy has asked, what is the difference between a pearl oyster and a regular oyster? Well, they're totally different genuses. It's Pinctata for the pearl oyster and Crassostrea for the local oysters, but they're, they have the same, they have oyster in their names, but I guess they're part of a larger taxon uh, of oysters, but they are very different in terms of structure. Um, and my guess is the pearl oysters probably live at deeper depths depths and it's salty water too. I don't know. But uh, certainly structurally uh, from the perspective of making anything out of them, they're a world of difference apart. Uh, the material is so much denser, more like porcelain with pearl oysters and regular oysters, you know, our oysters around here, they just, they just crumble if you try to drill a hole through them. How about as far as edible, would um, a pearl oyster be edible? Um, we don't really know. We haven't researched uh, what folks are doing, if anything, with the flesh from any of these shellfish. Um, we know in the Midwest, we have some documentation of them extracting the meat and feeding it to pigs. But it looks like a lot of this stuff, a lot of the flesh probably and the waste went right back into the streams. Hmm. Uh, and people were reporting on this 
you know, at the time, the first, second, you know, second, third decades of the 20th century, they were polluting the water and killing the shellfish, <laughs> killing the very source of material that was the foundation of the industry to begin with. So between overharvesting and pollution, they pretty much shot themselves in the foot. Um, but yeah, you could feed anything to pigs, especially if you cook it to basically kill uh, pathogens. And so we know some of it was being fed to hogs. By the time it arrived, this, the shells had arrived in Delmarva, they were just shells. They smelled pretty bad, I think. Uh, and the cutters would soak them in a barrel of water for a couple of days before they were considered ready for cutting. And they probably still smell pretty bad, but no flesh came with them. That's interesting. Um, here's another one. Did they ever use a setup where multiple plugs were cut in one movement? Not that we've seen. Uh, I would not be surprised if some prospective inventor tried to come up with something like that. Um, but, you know, it's basically a lathe. You've got one drive, you know, spinning all, you know, you've got the circular saw, tubular saw spinning on one drive. You would need, to, you know, multiple drive mechanisms to run multiple saws. The advantage to something like that, however, is you could, you'd, you'd be able to set those tubular saws very close together, make maximum use of the shell. But uh, I mean, uh, Jim Breedlove, who's on uh, on this, and and uh, uh, I think Pete Neal worked on this, and uh, Leo was on. Uh, you know, maybe they've seen something like that in their research, but I haven't seen anything come up. That's interesting. Um, does anybody have a question that they would just like to throw out there? Feel free to ask. I have a question. Sure. Karen? Hi, everyone. I'm wondering if these same uh, workhouses put the holes in the buttons for you to sew the thread through, or after the blank was cut, that was shipped someplace else for somebody to put the holes into it? How do you get the holes in the buttons? It's uh, basically a drill press. Uh, and uh, with the smaller shops, the one in El uh, Elliott Island accepted because they were around later and they were doing the complete thing. But most of these smaller shops were shipping this stuff up to New York where it would be finished, where they would polish them and uh, drill holes. And that process I refer to as knurling, K-N-U-R-L-I-N-G. That's where they create that kind of circular depression in the middle of the button. Right. And then once the buttons are finished, then, you know, they would be sorted by size and quality with machines to a certain extent. And uh, they would either be sold in bulk or they would have people who would sew, you'd look like one stitch uh, to sew the buttons onto those cards. Uh, but as far as I know, we weren't doing that on, uh, on Del Marva. Right, uh, right. You know, I think we were basically just doing bulk production, uh, even when they were being finished. But, you know, we're still working on this. The, the research is far from being done. Um, we've got, uh, two of our folks have published uh, on the work we've done. First, um, uh, Bailey Berry, who after publishing it and doing her stint with us, went to UCLA for a master's program. And her successor was Sierra Buke, who published a piece that just came out earlier this year in an archaeology journal. And she also went to UCLA for a master's program. So we're looking for the next person to take over this project. And if it turns out to be a young woman who then goes to UCLA, <laughs> then, then we have something much more interesting to research here than buttons, <laughs> some sort of crazy pattern going on. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're still working on this and you know, happy to have folks jump on board and join us. And Jim, Jim you, uh, can sorry. I ask one more? Could I ask again, please? Sure. Um, you mentioned um, that you're shipping the buttons up to New York. I am from Rochester, New York, and right on one of the very prominent streets is the Rochester Button Company. Mm. And uh, it closed in 1990, but I'm wondering if they might have been a recipient of some of these buttons. Uh, maybe they were the place that would finish them off for the des the designers or whoever was buying the buttons from them. That's, that's possible. We, we know that um, 
I think it's the Schwanda outfit that had a factory on Long Island, which is, if you haven't figured out, is where I'm from. Um, uh, one of the great sins, you know, in terms of industrial history, is these places close down and get demolished, and very rarely does anybody save the records. You know, they got to be filled with paperwork and ledgers that would have all kinds of information that would allow us to draw connections and develop a better understanding of what went on. Um, and it, all that stuff is almost never saved. Right. Uh, so yes, yeah, stuff may have gone up to Rochester, but um, you know, I don't know how we'll ever figure it out. I'll check you know, on that in for you. How's that? That'd be helpful. We know, <laughs> okay. We know All right. Were, we know that we're making shell buttons in New York State, central yeah. New York, because some uh, colleagues of mine have worked on some sites where they have found shell button cutting waste. Uh, but these were small scale, and not really what uh, what the SEAL team is working on. We're really looking at essentially mass production of these things. That's great. Not just small shops. Thanks so much. Sure. Thank you. Jim, if anyone did want to get involved in volunteering in the project, could they do that now during the pandemic? Or can they get involved? Well, we're still doing some work and we, there's a few people who can come into the lab. They're those who already have, you know, Smithsonian credentials and, you know, do the online uh, tutorial and proper, you know, pandemic etiquette. Uh, but we also have folks who are working online who don't need to come into the lab. Uh, and, you know, we have a couple, we have a couple of projects that they can get involved in. And we have one, those of who are on the call here who work with me are going to cringe. Uh, but I have a new initiative I want to begin that folks can participate in. And that is in five years, our nation will be celebrating its semi-quincentennial our 250th anniversary, 2026. And there's gonna be a lot of celebrating going on and now's the time to start planning. One of the things I'd like to do is start a research project where we look at the history of citizen science in the Chesapeake uh, on the eve of the revolution. We have a number of people who from the 1640s through the 1770s, who are essentially citizen scientists. They're going around, they're mostly looking at natural phenomena, you know, various sorts of plant and animal species and whatnot, but they're recording this stuff. And what I would like to do is learn as much as we can about these people and about what they learned, find out what specimens we can get a hold of and plan an exhibit for the Smithsonian uh, to open by 2026 that looks at you know, citizen science on the Chesapeake on the eve of the ev revolution. Um, we're just finishing an exhibit now. It'll be a new exhibit in the newly restored Selman House, uh, which the house should be restored, should be finished next month, I think. And the exhibit will open probably in October. And it's a regular Smithsonian e exhibition, you know, professional planners and designers and all that. Well, I would like to do another exhibit inside our very modern lab that looks at the history of uh, science in the area. So that's the sort of thing where we'll have to figure out what, you know, how to organize things, but folks can do research. A lot of this stuff could be found online. There a lot of stuff has been reprinted in books over the years, so it's, it's accessible. So if I were to share your email tomorrow in a follow-up email, would that be okay for them to get in touch with you if they're that would, interested in that? That would be great. Uh, folks can email me, call me anytime they want. Okay. Uh, happy to talk to folks. And again, you know, I can't see the faces <laughs> on here, but, you know, for those of you, you know, uh, who are thinking of a new career, who have kids or grandchildren, who are thinking about, you know, getting into the college of their choice or the graduate program of their choice, we're the best game in town for building some credentials and, um, Having Smithsonian Institution on your resume is not a bad thing to have. Uh, we've sent folks to, you know, a lot of places, Duke University, Glasgow, uh, University of Maryland, of course, UCLA, you know, all over the place getting, you know, their degrees. And, uh, you know, we can help and they can help us and have a good time too.
Well, and it doesn't sound like people have to have a lot of background in order to get started with you. So that's that's nice. You don't usually find that, right? Well, no. And although, you know, we've got a couple of folks here, Cindy and Bruce and Jim and you know, a number of these, these folks, they, they all have their own particular life experiences, which add to the mix. They're not, not necessarily trained as scientists, but um, they're, everybody's experiences play a role and expand our horizons. And diversity it. really is important. It's about it. I think that's nice. I also wanted to let everybody know before you signed off this evening that uh, Jim's next program that he's going to be doing with the library is going to be on March 29th. And I will send out the link if you would like to sign up for that. It's going to be called um, Life and Death on the Maryland Frontier. And we're Jim is going to be talking to us about the William and Magdalene Stevens Plantation in Calvert County. So I think that's going to be pretty interesting, Jim. That's old stuff, 1650s to around 1680s. So um, lots of neat finds, and we're actually reevaluating those collections now. And what do you mean by reevaluating? Well, going back as you know, we spoke before we began this evening with the bones, you know, looking at dietary patterns, we're revisiting uh, those materials as part of a larger book project on colonial dietary patterns. Uh, so the stuff is going to be pretty fresh. Great. Well, thank you. I will go ahead and share that in an email to everyone tomorrow. And if no one else has any more questions, I think that about wraps it up. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate you sharing your time with us tonight. Well, thank you all. It's good to see some old familiar faces there.